so love our Hollywood psychopaths. Turn on television at night and people watch Dexter about a serial killer, I guess, with a conscience. Does that make any sense? But in reality, psychopaths are everywhere, from down and out to high and mighty. The individuals who were psychopaths had very good careers. Therapy is no sure thing. My therapy was actually making him more violent. So how do we cope with them? If someone seems like they're really coming on strong, they promise the world with no hesitation, that's probably someone to be careful of. Run as far away from this type of person as possible. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald. Doc Zone turns a wary eye on the psychopath next door. Psychopath. It wouldn't be wrong if you conjured images of predatory killers, axe-wielding maniacs, or the infamous Hannibal Lecter upon hearing the word. I'll help you catch him, Terry. The psychopath holds a special place in our society because of our fascination with the dark side of humanity. But most psychopaths don't fit the stereotype. You're going to run into one of these individuals sometime in your life, more than once, and the encounter could either be exhilarating, thrilling, exciting, or devastating. More likely the latter. Psychopaths are not disordered. They don't suffer from a deficit, but they're simply different. Dr. Robert Hare is known as the godfather of psychopathy. A forensic psychologist at the University of British Columbia, he developed the psychopathy checklist used by law enforcement agencies and courts all over the world to identify those clusters of traits that only show up in psychopaths. His groundbreaking book, Without Conscience, pinpoints the hallmark of any psychopath, a total disregard of right and wrong. Most of the psychopaths are living right next to us and living a reasonably normal life but creating some sort of distress, psychological or environmental or financial for others around them. And psychopaths have always been with us, as far back as the written record. Nor do psychopaths discriminate when it comes to race or culture. Inuit lore described them this way. They refer to them as people whose mind knows what to do, but they don't do it. The ones who stayed behind, but all the others went out hunting. And they come back a couple of months later, and all the women are pregnant and say, what's going on here? But they had ways of dealing with these individuals. They didn't try to treat them or talk to them. They would get rid of them. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Bob. The study of psychopathic behavior is relatively new. It's been Bob Hare's life work. His diagnostic checklist is based on research with hundreds of criminals in Canadian prisons. If I want to study something, I go where it's likely to be. So the prevalence of psychopathy in prisons is high, and access to information is readily available. While psychopaths make up 25% of violent offenders in prison, most psychopaths are not criminals. It's estimated that between 1 and 2% of the general adult male population are psychopaths, which means there could be as many as 600,000 in Canada alone. They could be your neighbor, your boss, your friend, or your spouse. Hare considers them society's most dangerous individuals. His diagnostic checklist measures 20 key personality characteristics which reveal psychopathic traits. Egocentric, lacking remorse, guilt and empathy, deceitful, glib and shallow. Hare's checklist scores those characteristics on a scale from 0 to 40. The average score in a population might be 1 or 2. The average score in prisons is about 20, 21. And we use 30 out of 40 as a convenient threshold for defining psychopathy. Now that's very, very high, and that's light years away from the average person. In the general population, what other person gets a score of 10? I mean, this is, this is well below the threshold for psychopathy, but if you look at the characteristics, these are probably not very nice people. Psychopaths don't act or look crazy. They're not mentally ill. In fact, they're masters at appearing normal. Their main defect, what psychologists call severe emotional detachment, is harder to diagnose than schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. They don't feel emotion, but act as if they do. They know right from wrong, but lack remorse and empathy. Psychopaths are pathological liars who love to con and manipulate others. You're kind of surprised because you have the feeling that they think and feel the way we do. And they're going to respond to a situation much the way we do, and they're going to be empathetic and loving and warm and honest, full of integrity. And this often doesn't happen. In fact, they behave like predators. They are at the top of the food chain, 
and the rest of us are just lunch. In a psychopath's worldview, they are the cat, and we are all mice. The cat is a cat, and the cat doesn't know what the mouse is going through, nor does it care. If the mouse has got three little nieces at home somewhere, so what? It's a mouse, and I can eat it, and I do what I want with it. And the mouse is thinking, I'm a mouse, and what's that thing trying to do to me? And the mouse tries to impart its own values onto the cat. And the cat, of course, has a different set of values based upon its uh, evolution, right? So we have predators and prey. It's a recurring theme in the world of psychopathy research. They see themselves as the dominant species because our emotions make us weak. And psychopaths tend to be male. It's quite clear that psychopaths operate at a very basic physiological level. They don't experience the same kinds of emotions that the rest of us do that makes our lives quite rich, whether it's positive or negative emotions, sort of the, the roller coaster of life. As a psychopath goes through life largely flat, and but again engaging in various thrill-seeking behaviors to try to try to get a bit of a bang, to get away from that sort of flat line. Dr. Porter says psychopaths may be emotionally dead, but they're not psychotic, out of touch with reality. They know exactly what they're doing, quickly weighing the risks and benefits first. And it's all about reward. They are ultra-rational thinkers. They don't have the clouding of emotion that the rest of us do, and certainly make conscious decisions, rational decisions, about whether to commit an action that, at least at a cognitive level, they understand is wrong. That they know if they... Uh, stick a knife in that other person's chest that they will cease to breathe, that they will end up dying. They know that society looks at that behavior and that outcome extremely negatively. This is clearly an immoral act. It's a good weight there. We're so attracted by physical appearance that that trumps practically everything else about the individual. And we evaluate this person by how he or she looks and dresses and talks. They're going to go into something where they can take advantage of their talents, where there's power, prestige, control, sex, money. That's what they're going to go. They're not stupid. They go to the watering hole rather than somewhere out in the desert where there's no prey. They go where the prey are. And psychopaths are everywhere. Wolves in sheep's clothing blending in with the rest of us. Modern business is a perfect environment for them because it enables them to achieve the desires that they want in terms of money, in terms of controlling other people, in terms of gaining power and prestige, of course. British professor and author Clive Boddy believes psychopathic behavior was largely responsible for the global financial crisis. In England alone, the financial services sector accounts for one-third of the GDP, making the fallout even more damaging. Body says investment deals were so complex, even the brokers didn't understand them. You ask yourself what kind of people would sell a product that they don't understand and can't properly price. You'd have to be without conscience, wouldn't you, to sell that kind of thing. Psychopaths are risk-takers, ruthless in their single-minded focus, skills that corporations often value, skills that ensure a quick climb up the corporate ladder. And he ends up being a very successful businessman, so rather than go out and rob the bank, he becomes a director of the bank. So, depending upon the environment you're brought up in, how intelligent you are, how good-looking you are, if you learn to dress uh, and speak properly, and you're attractive, you're devastating. And if you're psychopathic, deadly. And Clive Boddy saw it all coming. A few years before the financial collapse, he began hearing that some bank executives went so far as to use Bob Hare's psychopath checklist to recruit employees. Presumably, that was because they thought those new employees would be cutthroat and ruthless towards their competitors. The danger, of course, is that they, they're cutthroat and ruthless towards the bank that employs them as well. It's like saying criminals are good at guarding Fort Knox, guarding the gold, guarding the crown jewels. The outcome would be inevitable. The, the gold would go missing, the jewels would be stolen. <laughs> Take Bernie Madoff, the former chairman of NASDAQ, who orchestrated a $50 billion Ponzi scheme. Madoff happened to get caught, if only as a result of the financial crisis. But people like him remain in positions of power, respected for their financial acumen. 
the first people the governments in the West turned to to help them get out of the global financial crisis were the very people who had caused the global financial crisis in the first place. If some of those people were people that have no conscience, as, as psychopaths are, then the advice that they give will not necessarily be in the best interests of either the companies they work for or the societies in which they live. But Body's current research on corporate psychopaths suggests senior levels of the British government feel the financial services sector is simply too big to fail. Better to tolerate the corruption than destabilize the banking system. I would argue that that would be an incorrect um, conclusion to come to because if the system has been corrupted by the presence of corporate psychopaths, then the best thing to do is to get those people out of there rather than hope that they, the problem will go away on its own, because it won't. Business ethics, corporate responsibility, best practices, buzzwords companies like to promote as part of their brand. But in the winner-take-all stakes of business, psychopathic values are winning out in the office. And those highly touted ethics quickly take a back seat. Sorry about the 15th there the other day. You got lucky, don't worry, it won't happen again. <laughs> that it won't. It's okay, I got it. In fact, the corporate world seems to be a natural habitat for psychopaths. One study of 203 executives across several companies found a much higher incidence of psychopathy than in the general population. Its author was Dr. Paul Babiak. And what we find surprisingly was that there was a rate of 3.9% in that population of individuals that had scored high enough on the psychopathy checklist that they had hit the, the mark for uh, being a, assessed as a psychopath. Babiak, along with Bob Hare, co-authored Snakes in Suits, When Psychopaths Go to Work, the first major study of psychopaths in the boardroom. Their findings caught the media's attention as people sought to understand how the financial crisis happened. Those that we found were rated high in psychopathy were rated very high in communication skills, charisma, uh, visioning, but they were also rated extremely low on performance productivity factors. Despite that, despite having that evidence showing that these were not good performers, the individuals who were psychopaths had very good careers and there was no threat of them losing their jobs. In fact, that they were still on succession plans to move up. Look, this is one hell of a deal. You know, you're not gonna get another deal like this. You're not gonna get another, another chance. This is it. Babiak describes the psychopath as the smooth, confident, fast-talking, rising star in the office. He knows what to say and who to say it to. It's easy for the psychopath to sing the right tune and hit all the right notes. Psychopaths are what I would call parasitic predators. They find a target, a victim organization, they latch onto it and they suck everything out of it that they can. Now, I'm swamped with meetings all day. Everyone has seen this guy. He's the one who takes credit for your idea, is never around when there's a deadline, makes an excuse for not being there, or blames everyone else when there's a failure. It's always about him. They serve only one master, themselves. They'll take credit for as much as they can, sometimes even claiming that they're giving advice to the vice president or the, the CEO, which is not true, but they want to get credit for it. Hey, Chloe. Hey, Marcus. How you doing? Babiak has identified the different kinds of psychopaths based on their favorite strategies for succeeding in the workplace. Well, you know, there's definitely a promotion in it for you. Really? For sure, and I can put in a good word with the boss as well. The con is an individual who uses their voice to manipulate people and is very verbally fluent, a facile with their voice. They're quite manipulative and they're good readers of people, so they tell a good story. They're often entertaining. They mix a lot of falsehood with truth, but you can't tell where one stops and the other begins. And so they get people to do things for them by conning them. Look, you're making me look bad. And if you can't get the job done, I'll find someone else who will. The bully is perhaps more crass. It's an individual who might start out using the conning techniques and manipulative techniques, 
but when they don't get their way, they tend to escalate a little and start using dominance and force to get what they want. Oh, hey, it's the truth. I mean, it's good that there's people like you around here, not like certain people. And the puppet master is really the master of them all. That's an individual who has the wide repertoire of uh, psychopathic traits. But what makes them so interesting is they get other people to do their dirty work. So the puppet master pulls the strings on a small group of individuals who are loyal to him or her. Well, I do give talks to business groups, and occasionally an individual during a break will come up and say, you know, that I'd like to hire people with some of these traits. Such corporate predators are often referred to as successful psychopaths. And I'd say successful in what respect? They've screwed a lot of people. They've ruined tens of thousands of lives, right? They make decisions that impact upon a whole society. And they do this without any particular concern, uh, remorse, no empathy for the population. Impressive. And they do it without any risk to themselves. It was very much a, a heads we win, tails you lose type of argument. Because no matter what they do, at the end of the day, they're not playing with their own money. They're not betting their own money and they're not betting their own bonuses or resources or careers even. Coming up, psychopathic behavior doesn't end with the workday. Those traits go home from the boardroom to the bedroom. In normal relationships, sex is bonding. I, I mean, that's how we're wired. We, we connect to, you know, our sexual partner. Um, except that experience is not happening on the other end with him. You look fantastic. Thank you, so do you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the psychopath knows how to project an aura of power, status, and excitement. He's driven to get whatever he sets his sights on. And when the object of his desire is a woman, he is a master of seduction. These men are anything but boring. And the women find that extremely attractive. His power, his dominance, his success in life. The beginning of the relationship, uh, very whirlwind, very um, love bombing. Uh, lots of gifts, money, trips, attention, sex, whatever. And so the intensity of that is like no other. Sandra Brown has studied how psychopaths lure their victims. A counselor and author of the book, Women Who Love Psychopaths, she's seen the pattern time and time again. It starts with targeting the right woman. As one psychopath admitted, He said, I throw a hook, a hook out um, for empathy. And depending on how they respond to that is whether I will pursue it. There's no use going there if she doesn't take the bait. And so that's, that's how they'll test the waters. I really want you to come next weekend to my dad's 60th. While psychopaths themselves have no empathy, they're masterful playing the sympathy card whenever it's needed. I was abused as a child. You're the only one that I could have told this to. I've never felt this way before. You're the only one that's keeping me off drugs and alcohol. You're the strength that I need in order to climb the career ladder at my job. They just find what works in terms of um, tapping into the empathy within, within the women. Another powerful tool in the psychopath arsenal is sex. Some theorize they have such a high sex drive because it's a physiological act that allows the psychopath to feel something. Sandra Brown thinks there's more to it. Most of the women have not had that level of hypersexuality. And the psychopath often has a reduced need for sleep, high need for stimulation, reduced need for sleep. And so the early parts of the relationship can be what we call marathon sex. There's a release of oxytocin, the sex hormone, which creates a sensation of bonding and also of trust. Once hooked, the psychopath works quickly to reel in his victim, moving in with her, proposing marriage, all in a heady rush before the mask starts to slip. That's just what happened to a woman we'll call Elaine, after a whirlwind romance with a man she thought was her soulmate. Out of concern for her safety and her children, we have concealed her identity. It was like being hypnotized. 
mind. It was, he would just gaze into my eyes and just have that intensity that there was no one else in the room but us. He seemed very charming. We had a lot of the same interests. We wanted to go camping, hiking, ballroom dancing. He seemed to value being a family man, a father, and, and have what had children, which was really what I wanted too. I wanted to have someone to share my life with. And I had hoped I was able to uh, make that dream come true with him. In my mind, I had hoped that I could be dancing with him until we were in our golden years. And then there were the revelations about his miserable childhood. He was the youngest of a family of eight, and that his how cruel his father was to him, and that his mom never had time for him. I, I just sensed this was a very sad and lonely soul, and I could feel that sadness in his heart, and I wanted to, to help um, share my love and, and understanding with him and just to help him have a brighter future. But there were warning signs that not all his stories were true. She discovered he wasn't single after all, but he assured her a divorce was imminent. Despite some nagging doubts, Elaine agreed to marry him. That's when everything changed. I didn't matter to him in the same way now that he, in a sense, had me, now that we were married. And just like the, the thrill was off of, of the, of the he, had, he was the hunter and he had caught the prey and he would get angry at the slightest thing. And we ended up, uh, all of us in the house, just we felt we were walking on eggshells around him. For instance, if someone just spilled some juice, he would hit the ceiling. Her new husband became cold and distant, spending hours on the computer. And one day she found out why. He sort of laughed it off and, and said, oh, I'm just, seeing what's out there. He could look you in the eye and lie, and yet, you know, it just didn't even blink. It, he he didn't, didn't phase him one bit. He was just a, a master at twisting the facts, twisting information. Soon after, she says, he began hurting their children. He tripped our uh, little boy, and then he smirked. It, those types of, when he was just learning to walk, I think that he really enjoyed that. But I remember I would look and then just be shocked by that, that, uh, that brief moment where he, where the mask dropped. Who am I with? Who is this person? And it does feel like he's a total stranger. You know, it made me feel like I was going crazy. As his angry outbursts escalated, so did her fear. On one occasion, the brakes on Elaine's car failed. I guess something could happen to your brakes, but at the same time, was he trying to hurt me? Was he hoping that I would get into an accident? Desperate for help, she went to see a counselor. His words were chilling. Your, your husband is a psychopath, and that his behavior, that he will always behave that way. They can't change. This is, this is hardwired in them, and that's what's so hard to understand. It's like if someone has an, a disease or an illness that will be with them. Elaine filed for divorce, ending her two and a half year marriage. They hurt their, uh, their partners financially, physically, emotionally, sexually, spiritually. And to me, that's, that's the worst on your very soul, that it's, it, is, it is so devastating. Marriage to a psychopath can be a nightmare. But what happens when the psychopath is your own child? Experts now believe it's possible to identify psychopathic tendencies in children as young as three. Callous, unemotional traits and lack of guilt about wrongdoing are the hallmarks. Red flags Doug Kirk and his wife tried to ignore in their son. The problems started in his early teens. He would borrow my bike and then it wouldn't come back. And I'd say, what happened to it? He said, it was stolen. Well, it turned out it wasn't stolen. He just pawned it. The pattern repeated itself. Tools would go missing stories concocted that eventually were discovered to be lies. Even though Kirk has a degree in psychology, he didn't know then what his son was. By the time he was 19, he became a master of manipulation. You know, he's handsome, tall, charming, intelligent, so no problem getting a job. But he wouldn't last more than a few weeks because he'd start stealing from people or lying to them and they'd fire him. You have kids, Other than you want them to be successful. Yeah. 
Like many psychopaths, Kirk's son saw an opportunity to capitalize on the financial crisis. So nine years later, his son called him out of the blue with a business proposition. There were hundreds of boats being repossessed down in the States. You know, the economy was just in terrible shape. But if you bought them right, you could still sell them up here. So he suggested, you know, if I had a few boats over the winter time that I could work on and get cleaned up and deal with whatever mechanical issues with it, then I'd have inventory to sell in the spring. And uh, I think I could do pretty well at it. And I bet. In the end, his own son took him for $300,000. Kirk is convinced there is nothing anyone can do to change or treat a psychopath. It's taken him a lifetime to understand that. And I still love him. He's my son. But you have to be realistic and you have to face facts. And you don't have to be duped time after time after time like I was. When we return, going inside the brain of a psychopath. You have brains that seem to be hypersensitive to reward, brains that seem to be undersensitive to the suffering of others. Um, you know, this is, this is the picture of psychopathy, right? So this is a brain of someone who is very dangerous. So does anybody recognize these lovely individuals up here on the screen? Anybody? These psychopaths may be notorious, but what science is still trying to unravel is the mystery of their minds. How does the psychopath think? How does he react? That's what UBC forensic psychologist Dr. Stephen Porter is trying to discover. A key experiment, how the psychopath goes about selecting his victim. It's very much like watching a lion looking for the weakest gazelle. And uh, very much premeditated, very carefully uh, sort of planned out antisocial behavior and ultimately preying on the individual in, in whatever way it might, they, they might desire. In an experiment using facial expressions, psychopaths could accurately detect fear in people from a very young age. Porter's colleague at UBC Kelowna, Dr. Michael Woodworth. We expected across the board they'd have trouble recognizing the different emotions due to their uh, emotional deficits. Uh, we found that they did actually better at recognizing fearful faces, uh, suggesting that even at quite an early age, uh, they are already starting to uh, engage in a sort of predatory-like thinking where they're able to pick out uh, certain individuals or see cues in their environment that would suggest this might be somebody that they could um, have as a victim. Neuroscience also offers clues as to what might be going on in a psychopath's brain. At the University of Wisconsin, Dr. Mike Koenigs uses an MRI scanner to compare the brains of normal subjects with those of psychopaths in prison. So there's a specific circuit very deep in the brain that is responsive to essentially anything that we find innately pleasurable. So things like money, drugs, sex, chocolate. Um, when you look at a psychopathic brain's response to reward, what we find is that the more psychopathic the individual is, the stronger that this area of the brain lights up to reward, called the amygdala, primary sort of fear center of the brain. And another circuit of the brain that we know to be responsible for empathy, for the regulation of emotion, for motivating pro-social behavior, for regulating our moral judgments, we also see some degraded connections in that circuit of the brain. There is reduced connectivity between these two areas of the brain, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. The primitive emotions of fear and pleasure-seeking weren't being moderated by the brain's executive power center. You have brains that seem to be hypersensitive to reward, brains that seem to be undersensitive to the suffering of others. Um, you know, this is, this is the picture of psychopathy, right? So this is a brain of someone who is very dangerous. So is the psychopath born bad, or does he become bad? Despite all the research, there is no widespread agreement. Some believe it's genetic, while others blame social environment. Truth is, it is a bit more complicated. The question of whether psychopaths are born and made is actually usually framed in the kind of the old-fashioned argument of nature and nurture. It's either nature or it's either nurture. Dr. Kevin Dutton is a professor of psychology at Oxford University. He says there are new dimensions to the debate. Now the buzzword is epigenetics. 
Now, epigenetics is basically uh, a, a, a kind of a subdiscipline of, of genetics, which looks at the way that various genes can be switched on by stimuli in your environment. Let's say that you've got a gun that's loaded, okay? Now, that, the bullet's not gonna come out of the end of that gun unless someone pulls the trigger. Now, the pulling the trigger is done, when we talk about psychopaths, for instance, is done by the environment, usually abusive um, or stressful childhood environment. But if you've got that gene and you have the environmental triggers uh, that do fire that gun, that's when you can start developing the psychopathic personality. Sometimes psychopaths can come from a good home, like serial killer Ted Bundy, one of the most violent psychopaths ever known. Today, there is no cure for psychopathy, so the search continues. But the experts all agree on one thing. The psychopath is very difficult to treat. When you go to the doctor or a psychiatrist, you're suffering pain, psychological or physical. What's the psychopath experiencing? None of these things. A psychopath doesn't recognize his own symptoms, so he sees no need to change. And studies with criminal psychopaths show treatment can actually make them worse. They pick up all the psychiatric jargon, parrot the right phrases, and become even more devious. In one case, Steve Porter tried therapy on a psychopathic inmate. A year into treatment, he discovered the prisoner's diary. He gave specific examples of, of lies he had told me and acting jobs that where I was kind of nodding my head and, and buying it. So essentially, in hindsight, I think my therapy was actually making him more violent. You're not going to magically inject empathy into somebody who does not have empathy. One strategy that might work is to appeal to the psychopath's self-interest, something California psychologist Dr. Robert Shug tries to do. You want to get them to understand that, you know, the way that they're acting and behaving, thinking and feeling, is actually harming them. It's actually slowing their progress in life. It's actually giving them sort of a lower quality life than they could have. Marcus, you pull this off, could work out very nicely for you. What type of bonus we talking? According to the latest studies, this approach is showing promise. Deal. Some experts say early intervention is the key. They believe children who display antisocial behavior and callous, unemotional traits can be turned around. If you can get some of these individuals uh, well, they're still adolescents, so maybe just developing psychopathic individuals. Uh, then one can do quite a bit with them. If we get them young, then we can do something. If we go farther down the age scale, down to age six, seven, and eight, which we couldn't talk about a few years ago. What, psychopathic kids, children? Well, no, these are children with ha that have certain propensities, uh, personality traits, that could develop into the adult form of the trait. Even if we cannot effectively treat psychopaths, Dr. Kevin Dutton believes in some cases that's okay. Dutton is the best-selling author of The Wisdom of Psychopaths. He believes it can be good to be bad and likens psychopathic traits to knobs or sliders in a mixing studio that might be turned up too high. But if you are intelligent and you are non-aggressive, and you have some of these dials turned up a little higher than others, depending on the circumstances, depending on the context, then that can predispose you uh, to actually great success in various professions. Don't get me wrong. When I'm talking about successful psychopaths, I'm not talking about your pure psychopaths, your psychopaths who are right at the extreme level, who have all of those mixing desk dial characteristics turned up to max. What's important is that you have the right combination of traits, ruthlessness, fearlessness, focus, coolness under pressure, dialed up at the right levels within the right context. While researching his controversial book, Dutton carried out a UK study to find out which occupations attract psychopaths. When we looked at the top 10, it was very, very interesting indeed. Okay, sure, CEOs were number one. We had lawyers at number two. We had uh, media, especially TV uh, and radio at number three. Uh, we also had surgeons. The list includes hero populations such as law enforcement, rescue services, the military and special forces. There's a very common sense reason for that. If you've got people who are charming, who are charismatic, who are ruthless, who are fearless, who are cool under pressure, focused and mentally tough, uh, the James Bond personality, okay? James Bond is the poster boy for functional psychopathy, okay?
My name is Jordan Belfort. The year I turned 26, I made $49 million, which really pissed me off because it was three shy of a million a week. Our infatuation with the psychopath through flattering portrayals in the media, best-selling novels, TV dramas, and of course Hollywood movies, may be shaping society toward a less moral world. Was all this legal? Absolutely not. The media also has a way of, in some respects, celebrating the psychopath, right? So there are some traits um, associated with psychopathy that people just think are kind of neat. You turn on television at night and, and all the programs are about murder and mayhem. People watch Dexter about a serial killer, I guess, with a conscience. Does that make any sense? Over here in the UK, we've got shows like Fear Factor, X Factor, The Apprentice, uh, weakest link where the emphasis is all on cutthroat, every man for himself, loosening of inhibition, uh, instant gratification. The psychopathic style of life is much admired by a lot of people. And this is essentially unfortunate. That is, look out for number one, get what you can, uh, make sure you retaliate, uh, get your shots in first, right? And uh, don't worry too much about what your impact is, is, is upon other people. Never before have we had such exclusive... In a rather unconventional experiment, Dutton literally went inside his own brain to better understand what it might feel like to be a psychopath. Using a technique called transcognitive stimulation, Dutton mimicked how a psychopath's brain is hardwired. So, for instance, I turn down my anxiety levels a little bit and my inhibition levels. And I have to say, it did feel very different indeed. It felt like um, you've had maybe a bottle of wine, but without the attendant sluggishness, without the attendant tiredness. Uh, you felt very confident. Uh, nothing really mattered too much. You felt like you could do anything. Uh, and there was a sense of bravado as well. Um, if I could bottle it, I would. Um, but fortunately, um, uh, for those around me, uh, it did wear off after half an hour. And Dutton agrees psychopathic traits are winning out in today's top professions, from politicians to pro athletes. If you've got a guy in a boxing ring and he's got his opponent against the ropes, he would be a complete fool not to finish him off as quickly as possible, as clinically and as effectively as possible. You want to do that in business and all of a sudden people say, hey, you know, is that fair? Maybe that's unethical. But actually, I would say, you know, in sport, it's absolutely, it's what you're meant to do to be a great champion. You need that ruthlessness, you need that focus, you need that kind of detachment of emotion from behavior in order to be a great champion. When we come back, they are here to stay. And as we learn more about psychopaths, can we also learn how to protect ourselves? Let me ask you this then, if you could cause harm and hurt people and just not go back to prison, would you? Oh, hell yes, yes, yeah. I, I would be lying to say, say no. Welcome back, Aftermath Radio, where we talk about all things psychopathic. I'm very excited about our next guest. We have Psychology professor Dr. Robert Shug hosts an internet radio program. He hears from victims worldwide and also from psychopaths themselves. I am a high-functioning sociopath. However, I've been at the bottom of the barrel. Prison time, lots of violence, and lots of manipulation, lots of harm to other people. Now I try my best not to do those things. Let me ask you this then. If you could cause harm and hurt people and just not go back to prison, would you? Oh, hell yes. Yes. Yeah. I, I would be lying to say, to say no. So this is really based more on a practical decision to stay out of prison. In, in success, in success in life, I have a big picture of things that I want out of life. What I'd like to do to some people is highly illegal. Well, there you have it. That's not something you hear every day. Words straight from the mouth of the self-proclaimed psychopath. But I think it's very important to pay attention to them. It's very important to be forearmed with information about what the psychopath can do because odds are very great that you will run into one in your own life. And when you do, it's crucial to recognize the red flags. The experts offer a survival guide, what you need to know to protect yourself. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So if someone seems like they're really coming on strong, they're really glib, superficial, fast talkers, seem really interested in you, promise the world with no hesitation, that's probably someone to be careful of. Don't be influenced by props and appearances. The winning smile, the captivating body language, the fast talk, they blind us from their true intentions. 
They're often the guy that opens the door to talk with you about a great business deal that you just can't pass up, and they actually seem genuine and real. Don't wear blinders. Enter new relationships with eyes wide open. Anyone who seems too perfect is likely far from it. Ask lots of questions. Whatever you're feeling, and if you do question things with, with your partner, then it's, it is best to trust those instincts. Follow your, your gut feelings and run as far away from this type of person as possible. Know yourself. Psychopaths know what buttons to push. Be aware of your vulnerabilities and blind spots and be wary of anyone who zeroes in on them. Set firm ground rules. Psychopaths want control, so establish and maintain strict boundaries. If you find yourself a target, know when to cut your losses and get professional help. If people know what to look for, if they understand the, the true essence of this disorder, if they realize how vulnerable they really are, if they don't pay attention to the red flags, if they understand how intense the damage can be if they ignore the red flags, this can all be very helpful and I think it could go a long way towards stopping you know, the amount of destruction that these individuals can cause. When Doxone returns next week, we're looking at the plight of working mothers. A sure way to a sharp pay cut is to become a mom. Motherhood systematically de-skills huge numbers of women. It's not just a mommy issue. This is really a human rights issue. The mother load. And here's a snapshot of some documentaries we're getting ready for the new year. Canadians are buying into exotic and outright illegal pets. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. People will tell you implicitly, I trust this animal with my life, and they do. Wild and dangerous. After that... <laughs> robots are taking on hundreds of human tasks. Helping humans is my job. Some are obvious wins. Some are a little unsettling. I'm ready for life. There's no line we won't cross. Do you think I'm sexy? Which is to say, we will cross any line. Roboticize me. And then, TV is dead. Long live TV. Television is a crapshoot. But where's it all going? And is Netflix really the killer app? I just finished watching Orange is the New Black. Breaking Bad. Dexter. TV renaissance. Later on, the next frontier in sexual identity. I, I could be a girl or I could be a boy. Take a deep breath and out. I have had 10 year olds tell me they wish they'd transition when they were eight. I've never had a single person say I'm glad I waited. Most people, if they meet somebody and they can't tell whether they're male or female, are, are dumbstruck. They don't know what to do. And the long, long shadows cast by Canada's war in Vietnam. Canada's role was very clearly one of aligning with the U.S., supporting U.S. positions, providing U.S. with information. I don't think most people in Elmira even knew that Uniroyal were making war materials or chemicals for the war effort. The Canadian pullout was a furtive operation with a certain amount of deceit. It, it was not a great moment for Canada. Our documentaries are always available at cbc.ca slash doczone. I'm Anne-Marie McDonald. Thanks for watching. Should you vaccinate your child? There's a lot of risk with vaccines. The shocking advice some alternative health practitioners are giving you. This is really not a dangerous disease. I think it's irresponsible. I think it's frightening. Marketplace, Friday at 8 on CBC. You're not a restaurant guy. Catch the dragons on a special night. There's a strategy to all of this. We did about $10 million in sales. What made you come up with this? Do you mind going into the rap pit? Hold it for a minute. Dragon's Den, Sunday at 8 on CBC. Brought to you in part by Scotiabank. In the justice system, court is the easy part. What am I meant to say? But winning the cases is up to one woman. Losing is not an option, Janet. Janet King, Sunday at 9 on CBC.